The Australian Paralympic table tennis team headed off to Rio with high expectations, but knowing that Australia hadn't won a medal at the Paralympics since 1984. So I came into the Paralympic program without any real experience in coaching Paralympic athletes. So how did that transition work out for me? For me, it was pretty simple because coaching athletes with disabilities isn't any different to coaching able-bodied athletes. It's looking at what the athlete needs, looking at their skills and how we can develop their skills. We have athletes in Perth and up in far north Queensland, a distance of 5,000 kilometres or 3,000 miles between them. So we don't get the opportunity to get all of our players together on a regular basis. We have a camps based program where we get the players together three to four times a year for their national championships and then at some camps. So how do you monitor athletes from all over the country? What we're able to do is connect with athletes all around the country through the internet, watching players training, giving them feedback on the spot and live. Welcome to the Ping Skills Table Tennis Show. Each week we pick a theme, and this week's theme is the Paralympic Games. Recently, Alloy's attended the Paralympics as a coach of the Australian team and had some success. So we hear about his experiences and how the Australian team went. In addition, we'll have our regular segments, the tip of the week, the drill of the week, and remember when. First up though, let's hear some more about how one of our athletes went, San Von Einem. Sam Von Einem went into the Paralympics ranked number six in the world. But we knew that he had some great results going in and we also knew that he had put in a really good preparation leading up to Rio. A lot of background work had gone into researching his opponents. A lot of work with our skills acquisition specialist, Ross Pinder, doing some research, putting together a playbook for Sam that detailed things as, as detailed as what he was going to eat each day and at what times. So having those things in place allowed Sam to just focus on what he was doing on the table. So Sam went in with a really tough draw. He drew Criange, one of his biggest rivals from France a player with long pimples on his backhand, and he knew going in, he had to beat Criange to progress to the quarterfinals. Lose, and that was it for his Paralympic dream. He had lost to Criange twice previously in Europe, just a few months earlier, the second time a 3-0 drubbing. Through some fantastic play, Sam was able to get over the top of Criange and progress out of his group and into the quarterfinal. He got a good draw for, for him in the quarterfinal against Sun Byung Jun from Korea, a player that he had recently beaten in Europe, but it wasn't going to be that easy. He went into the match well prepared, ready to go, but suddenly found himself down two games to nil, the second game losing 11-1. The conditions in the stadium that day were very steamy and the rubber was a little bit slippery. Sam had to change his tactics. What he was doing wasn't working. So what he had to do was become a little bit more defensive, allow Son Byung Jun to take up some of the attack and then counter attack against him. That simple tactic worked wonders. Sam came back and won the match three games to two and progressed to the semi-final. So there he met Son Byung Jun's compatriot Kim Gitae. Again, on paper, Sam looked favourite, but again, he found himself in trouble. Yes, come on, come on, Sam. 
Suddenly, he had got over the top of Kim Gitay and the realisation that he had secured a medal for Australia, their first in 32 years. He went into the final relaxed, knowing that he had an opportunity to win a gold, but also knowing behind him he had already secured a medal. He went in playing the best table tennis of his career and actually led the number one seed two games to one and had him in some real trouble. But Van Acker, the champion that he is, was able to come back and win the match three games to two. Van Acker gold, Von Einem silver.
There is the old saying, it takes a village to raise a child. And similarly, to produce a table tennis player, it takes not one or two, it takes a village of people to help that player to reach their pinnacle. In Sam's case, who was around him? Physiotherapist, strength and conditioning specialist, skills acquisition specialist, psychologist, coaches, parents, sibling. It's all about that whole team around that actually helps to secure a medal at the Paralympics. Another opportunity presented itself in the women's teams event. The Australian women's team of Melissa Tapper and Andrew McDonnell got through a tough quarterfinal match against Turkey, a team they had lost to just a few months earlier in Europe. Winning that match gave them the opportunity to move into the semi-final against China. Tough opposition. It wasn't to be losing 2-0, but it then presented them with a bronze medal playoff against the host team of Brazil. What an opportunity to play in a stadium of screaming Brazilian fans, thousands of them just all willing and wanting their Brazilian team to win. It isn't an opportunity that many table tennis players get to play in a stadium packed of screaming table tennis fans. Heartbreakingly close to a bronze medal, but not being able to secure it. They'll look back in years to come on the effort and how great the result was to finish fourth at the Paralympics. For you, Alice, what was your personal highlight of the Paralympic Games? Um, a couple of things. Well, certainly securing the medal was, uh, was the highlight of the Games, but also just being able to see the vast array of athletes in table tennis to start with, but then also just the vast array of athletes across all of the sports. When you, when you sit in that dining hall, which was approximately 300 metres long, and you just see the different things that players, athletes need to cope with day to day, it really brings it home to you. These athletes are special. The tip of the week is all about tournament preparation. So you're preparing for your big tournament. What are the things that you need to do? Well, for me, the really important things about preparing for a big tournament is the little things that you do. There are the obvious things. It's the type of training you're going to do in that week leading up to the tournament. So what type of training is important? Make sure you make your tournament preparation specific. Start to focus on your service, your return of service and your third ball. Think about the ways that you win matches and focus primarily on practicing your strengths in that last few days. Make your training relevant. Make it look like a game. We often focus a lot on what type of training we do in that lead up preparation. And that's really important. But what are the other little things that you need to consider? For me, you need to think about your sleep. How much sleep are you getting, not only the night before, but in the week before? If you go into a tournament and you're not well rested, it will have an effect on your results. This is similar with the food that you're putting into your body. Your body needs to be in peak condition for the tournament. What type of food are you having? Not only the night before, but in the whole week. Make sure it's a nice balanced diet. There's plenty of information out there as to what are the good foods that you need to eat in your preparation for a tournament. And make sure that you're well hydrated. Again, this isn't only talking about what you're drinking on the day, but it's the days leading up to your tournament. In the day before particularly, make sure you drink plenty of water. If you're 
well hydrated the day before, then on the day, you will be okay. So make sure that you're paying good attention to how much water you're putting into your body. Think about going into the tournament as relaxed as you can. So what is going to help you to be more relaxed? One, making sure that you've got all the little bits and pieces in place. If it's homework, make sure you've got your homework done. If it's work, make sure you've got your work done and well under control. The worst thing you could do is go into the tournament in a stressed state. So knowing that at the end of the tournament, you've got three assignments due. Make sure you've got all those work and school issues under control. It's also important to just have those little details organised. Things like, how are you getting to the venue? What time are you going to leave? What time are you going to get there? Who are you going to practice with when you get there? Now, you may not be able to solve all of those issues, but if you start to think about it, then you'll have a bit of a plan in place when you get to the venue. So you've spent weeks, months, or maybe even years preparing for these tournaments. So take the time to make sure you get the little things in place in that last week before you play. Our drill of the week this week is a smashing drill. This drill involves Jeff doing a lot of running, which is great. I'm gonna stand here, I'm gonna lob a ball up. Jeff's gonna smash it, but then he's gotta run around, pick up the ball and give it back to me and then get back for the next smash. <laughs> I love it. So try to time the lob so that Jeff's just getting back in time. Whoa! And doesn't have too much time to aim at me. And what we're going to do is we're going to make it that Jeff's got to do 20. Now, if he misses, it doesn't count as one of his 20. And if you want to be really tough, you can make him go back one every time he misses a smash. So what's he on? One. <laughs> Down one. So you can see this is both a bit of a physical training and some practice with smashing. Clearly I need to work on my smashes. <laughs> Want to improve your touch? Go to pingskills.com. For Remember When this week, we're not going back very far. We're talking about the new coaching rule. Remember when, the 30th of September 2016, you weren't allowed to coach unless it was between games. That was a couple of weeks ago, Jeff. I know, so it's not very long ago at all. No, but some of us don't have a very good memory, so... Yes. Exactly. Now, it is, seems to be quite a large rule change here, Alois. People, uh, coaches are now allowed to coach in between points. Yeah, they are. So previously, the coaches weren't allowed to coach their players um, during, the, uh, during the game. They were allowed one minute in between games and they had one timeout per match. But now, the rule has changed so that basically the coaches are allowed to coach any time during the game, almost. But that doesn't, surely they can't just bring the player over and have a, a long conversation. No, no, so they're not allowed to, you're not allowed to um, delay the match or impede the match at all. So you can't say, hang on, come over here for a sec. No, so you, but you can, if, uh, if you're playing, I could just sit in the sidelines and say, Jeff, serve to the forehand. Hmm, interesting. So what are your thoughts on this? Do you like this? Hate it. <laughs> hate it. I okay. hate it, Jeff. Now, you're not the only one. It seems that the US Tableton Association dislikes this rule as well. Yeah, so the US uh, Association has actually banned it um, for all of their tournaments, except the ITTF sanctioned tournaments, of course, because um, if you have the US Open, for example, then, um, then you have to play by the ITTF rules. Now, I wonder if they considered the alternative to this and to sort of ban coaching at all during games. You see this in big t tennis tournaments, um, they're, they're just on their own for the whole match. No, no interaction with the coaches at all. Yeah, so I understand why the rule has been brought in. So basically it's, 
it's almost to level up the playing field because previously, you know, some coaches were able to get their message across during um, during the games. How? So, uh, you just you just you know give them a little bit of a signal here or there. You when they come over to the corner, when the when the ball comes into the corner, you know, you give them a bit of a message. You know, serve the forehand. Yeah. Um, you know, in Rio with the really um, loud and active crowds, the umpires could not t- uh, yeah. tell what the coaches were saying. Um, they obviously look at the coaches in between points, yep. but it's really hard um, you know, to, for, for the coaches to police what's going on. Okay, so this new rule just means anyone can say whatever they want, you don't have to, the umpires don't have to worry about um, policing it, makes it easier for them. Yeah, exactly. But I'm going to have to cough. But it doesn't <coughs> give an advantage to the uh, non-English speakers because if you have your own native language now, basically you can just yell out um, in between points and the, um, their opponent, if they don't understand that language, you know, they might speak a bit of Lithuanian um, the, and your opponent doesn't understand Lithuanian, you can just yell out whatever you want, gives an advantage to the non-English speakers perhaps? Well, not necessarily non-English, just um, those that know a second language or a different language. Yeah, they can, exactly. Uh, yeah. Th- those that have a, a good little language up your sleeve. So that might be part of our table tennis training tips from now on. We will uh, invent our own pin skills language, perhaps. <laughs> uh, I don't know that it's worth the hassle. <laughs> um, yeah, but I don't know. I, I kind of like... I would have liked them to go the other way and just ban coaching altogether. I guess that brings its own problems. You've still got to police it. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, I think given the two options, I te- for once, Jeff, I tend, to, <laughs> I tend to agree with you. I would have liked to go the other way so that there's no coaching at all. Um, but again, it's still difficult to please. Now, you talked about the, the tennis example. Um, I tell you, the tennis coaches are still getting their message across to the players. You know, there's a little bit of a here or a here or a wiggle or a... Uh, yeah, so, so it's still happening. Yeah, a little bit, maybe. Yep. Um, all right, well, we have an interesting article on our blog about this as well, so I'll put a link in the show notes. Make sure you get on there, have a look at it, and leave a comment and let us know what you think about the new coaching rule. If you want to improve your table tennis, go to pingskills.com. For the tournament wrap, we're looking at the Men's and Women's World Cup. Welcome to the tournament wrap. This time we're looking at the Men's World Cup and the Women's World Cup, which happened recently. The Men's World Cup in Germany in early October and just shortly after the Women's World Cup in the USA. Tell us a little bit about these events, Alois. Yeah, so the, uh, starting with the Men's World Cup, um, I suppose the first thing that happened is that Ma Long didn't play due to injury, pulled out, um, but uh, that left the way open for a couple of his compatriots, I suppose, and you know, the Chinese, as we know, very dominant. Certainly, um, yes, and so um, uh, Fan Zen Dong, obviously, then a strong favourite, and Zhu Zin, a strong favourite. Yeah, so they went in uh, number one and two seeds for the event, and the winner was Fan Zen Dong beating Zhu Zin. So the final was um, a 4 1 victory to Fan Zen Dong over Zhu Zin. Um, along the way, no real uh, problems for, for any of the players. So Fan Zendong beat Gao Ning in the first round, uh, 4-0. Beat Jung Young Sik um, 4-1. Now, Jung Young Sik, uh, if you remember, is the, is the player that troubled Ma Long at the Olympics. So, uh, so Fan Zendong putting him well and truly back in his place. Um, and then uh, in the semi-final, uh, probably the, the surprise semi-finalist was Christian Carlsen. And we had two Swedes in the quarter-finals of the, of the Men's World Cup, which is, you know, real, pretty exciting. Is this the rebirth of the Swedish dynasty? Are they the ones that are going to give uh, China the problems again, you know, like they did uh, earlier on? You know, on paper it looks like the Japanese, but... Christian Carlsen making the, the uh, semi-final. Pargarel, one of our favourites at Ping Skills, making the quarter-final. So Pargarel going down 4-1 to Zhu Zin. 
um, in the quarterfinal. So, um, yeah, who did those guys beat to make it to their respective spots? Yeah, so Pugarel beat uh, Apollonio 4-1 in the in his first round. Um, Christian Carlson was probably the, the big surprise packet, taking out Dmitry Ovtarov in round one of the elimination. Now, you know, we've put this little question mark over Ovtarov in the big events. He's done pretty well previously, but... Um, here, going down 4-1 to Christian Carlson. You know, I think I think this event would have been a difficult event for the players um, yep. coming up so soon after the Olympics. Um, but I would have thought that um, Ovcharov would have been pretty focused, especially with the event being in Germany. Um, did he feel too much pressure, perhaps? Yeah, could have done. Yeah, it's always hard to know, isn't it? In your hometown, that... Often people think you're going to get a lot of support that's so going to be good for you, but you see over and over, people struggle when playing big events in their own country. Yeah, and so here, Ovtrov yeah, losing in, that, in his first match. So Carlson progressing to the, to the quarters uh, where he beat uh, Simon Gorzi in a really close tussle, 12-10 in the seventh game. So, uh, so a big breakthrough for, for Carlson for me. Um, you know, getting to the semi-finals of the of the men's World Cup, huge event. Yeah, let's see if that uh, pushes him on to bigger and better things. Um, now let's take a look at the women's event, allies. What happened there? Yeah, so again, a few surprises. Again, the the biggest surprises were that the Chinese didn't turn up, so they didn't play in the event. So Ding Ning and um, Liu Xi Wen both. Uh, pulled out. So is this a good thing for table tennis? We often see that everything's just won by the Chinese, you know, so do we want, like occasionally, the Chinese pulling out so that other people get a chance and, you know, Ma Long pulling out of the World Cup, is this good or do you just want to see the best players? Um, I want to see the best players, but having said that, it's not terrible that some of these other guys get the opportunity to win such major events. Um, Yeah, so... Not so bad, huh? And But, I mean, in the men's, Fan Zendong still ends up on top. Yes. Um, interestingly, we didn't talk about Fan Zendong also just after the Olympics at the China Open. So I would think a pretty big event for the Chinese players, no matter what, took out Ma Long. Oh, is that a changing of the guard? Maybe, maybe. You know, beating Ma Long at the China Open, winning the China Open, and then winning the Men's World Cup. Fan Zendong, you know, we did talk about maybe Tokyo for him. Yeah, so he didn't get a gig at the Olympics, and now suddenly he just seems like he's on top of the world. But um, it's a bit early to write off Ma Long. Let's see, see how this plays out. Yeah, that's right. I mean, Ma Long definitely will be on a bit of a downer after the Olympics. You know, he, he, that, that was his pinnacle. Um, he's, achieved, um, he's achieved that now. He's become world men's singles champion, Olympic singles champion, um, will allow him a little bit of a letdown time. Yeah, indeed. So back to the women's? Sorry, back to the women's. Um, yeah, so no Ding Ning, no Lu Xi Wen. Number one seed, Feng Tian Wei from Singapore, um, didn't get the job done. So she, uh, she beat Sabine Winter from Germany in the, in the quarterfinal um, and then came up against Mu Hirano. Now, Mu Hirano is probably, you know, the f- little bit of forgotten young Japanese player. Uh, came up against Mima Ito in the quarterfinal. So the two young players facing off against each other. Um, doubles partners, you know, they were the youngest uh, pair to ever win a women's doubles on the world tour. Facing each other in the quarterfinal of the, of the Women's World Cup. Mima Ito took the first game and looked pretty good. You know, it was a really strong um, first game by both players. But then Miu Hirano ran away with it, winning four games to one. Um, so in the scores in the, other, in the last four games, so um, Mima Ito winning the first game 13-11, but then it was 4-8-4-8 four, eight, four, and eight to Miu Hirano. You know, maybe just stamping her um, authority on the young up-and-coming Japanese title. Very impressive effort there. Um, but she didn't stop there, Alice. No, yeah, so, uh, so then came up against Feng Tian Wei in the, in the semis. Um, on the other side, uh, 
Tiana played Cheng Yi Ching, so Tiana from Hong Kong played Cheng Yi Ching from uh, Taipei in the semi final. Cheng Yi Ching winning four games to two. Miu Hirano taking on Feng Tian Wei and winning 4 2 in that as well. So the final of the Women's World Cup, Miu Hirano from Japan playing Cheng Yi Ching from Taipei. And the winner was Miu Hirano. And I um, have to say, she, she did it pretty well too. So she, uh, she, really, she really took it to um, Cheng Yi Ching, winning 4-0, 9-5, 4 and 8. So that is a drubbing. So in her last you know, um, few, few games, some really strong play by Miu Hirano to take the title. Yeah, very impressive, isn't it? Um, great to see some young players coming through um, and, yeah, winning such a big event, the World Cup. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely great effort from Miu Hirano. And, and I think, you know, just, it, it's, it, I think, is probably one of those breakthrough events mm. for, for Miu Hirano. You know, she's been in the shadow of Mimorito a little bit um, yes. and, uh, and the other Japanese players. But, uh, yeah, this is, this is a big step forward. You know, there's always that little question mark no Chinese there but to get the job done yep really? great effort and it's going to be interesting for Japan they've got Ai Fukuhara is getting older still pretty young probably but compared to these young players um, good to see some you know young talent coming through and maybe there'll be some more changes coming who knows yeah and, and you know like I think worldwide both in the men's and the women's for me the Japanese teams as a whole, are the, are the teams that are really pushing through. And, you know, if anyone has got a chance against uh, the strong uh, Japan, uh, Chinese players, you know, maybe it's the Chinese, uh, the Japanese team, I'm getting all confused. It may be the Japanese team pushing through. And we know that to get the job done, you need a big group around you. You don't, you can't just come through as one player. And this looks like a little bit of a dynasty of Japanese, both men and women, pushing their way through now. Yes, indeed. All right, well, it looks like an interesting time for table tennis over the next few years. Uh, that's a wrap of the tournament wrap. Thanks so much for watching this week's show. It's brought to you by PingSkills, so make sure you go to pingskills.com and check out all the great tutorials we have on table tennis. Hopefully we can help you improve your game. The music from today's show was Brontosaurus by Topher Moore and Alex Alana from the YouTube Audio Library. Alois has recently given up the disco dancing and taking up fishing and he thinks he caught a pretty big fish. Which was approximately 300 metres long. Once again, thanks for watching and until next time, keep enjoying your table tennis.